everybody. Welcome to Bacon and Coffee. I have a great guest today, but before we get started, let's go ahead and do our 30-second countdown. And now for your shot of digital caffeine and pork. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Bacon and Coffee. And I am thrilled to have a longtime friend and incredible business coach. Her name is Doreen Petty. And Doreen, you and me go way back to the 1980s. Um, boy, uh, I was wearing bell bottoms at the time and stuff like that back when we were both working at AT&T in Lyle, Illinois, right? Yep, yep. And I was in media services, so I was doing video production and shooting and editing and all that kind of fun stuff. And what was your job? I forget again. Was it HR? Back then, it was not yet HR. I think I first met you when I was working. It might have even been while I was still working as a random clerk. But then I was also working in conference services. So I, I remember specifically that you and I worked together in conference services um, in setting up video activities in conference rooms and things like that. Yep. So, and so I got into the HR world in 1985. So we knew each other prior to that. So that's how long. That's, that's correct. Because I remember that. I remember going into the big conference room that we had with the huge rear projection screen and setting up overhead projectors with text <laughs> on clear sheets that went on top of them before PowerPoint. And, and people would type up these things and they put it up there and you'd, you'd be sitting there going, I can't read that. Boy, is this bad. <laughs> I, still, I still have Mylar sheets with presentations on them when I used to do presentations for Native American culture thing. I still have some of those, wow. some of those presentations on the Mylar sheets. It's pretty amazing. That is amazing. So um, tell everybody a, a little bit about your journey and what kind of stuff that you, um, you know, what you've done since you've left AT&T. Talk about that. Oh, yeah. So I retired from AT&T. Actually, I, I did the gamut through AT&T. I worked for Bell Laboratories, then AT&T proper, then uh, AT&T Network Systems and a Lucent Technologies and Alcatel Lucent, and uh, and I broke off in 2009 to um, open my own practice. So I retired in 2009 with the express expectation that I was going to open my own uh, business coaching practice, and so that's what I've been doing for the last. 12, 10, 12 years, 11 or 12 years, and it's been uh, awesome. But it was my experience with AT&T that, that pushed me into that because I started doing coaching, oh, at least 20, 25 years ago as part of the process of en engaging leaders and engaging uh, emerging leadership in the organizations. And the coolest thing about working for AT&T or working for Lucent or the whole you know, telephony in that entire evolution of organizations was it was like taking a world tour every day. So there were so many people from all over the world and there was not a question that people couldn't ask and there wasn't a conversation that people couldn't step into. People invented things walking down the hall to get coffee in the morning or to get lunch. It was just amazing. That, yeah, it was it, it was a very yeah. social company. I remember that very well because um, we had yeah. this huge campus with five buildings. And in the first building was the lunchroom, which was this big. And it, it's the one thing that you see from the road when you're going down Warrenville Road in Lyle. 
Uh, this is before they put the Harvester, International Harvester building or whatever building in front of it. Right. But it was this big glass window semicircle restaurant that you would sit every day and have lunch. And it was amazing. You just sit and talk with some just incredible brains. I mean, some of these people, yeah. you know, <laughs> They were writing software, and I remember going down into the basement because we, you know, the cool thing about what we did is we got to see every nook and cranny of everything because yeah. we were always shooting video. And uh, I remember going down into the basement with all the computers and the humming. And back then, hard drives were these big washing machines with these yeah. discs that were, you know, the the size of, um, you know, huge like a, a you know a four foot bunt cake. That's <laughs> what yeah. it looked like. <laughs> yeah. There was um, and so similar things at the big AT the the Indian Hill, right there down the street in Naperville. So so those two large buildings, then you know other buildings, sh shot up and and eventually we moved into a, a an era of downsizing, and by then I was well into what what we call HR business partner work. So it's kind of like an internal consultant, and so I was way too involved in that whole downsizing. And I did in 2003, I used to do these um, walkabouts where I would take my coffee and go from coffee room to coffee room and just walk by and get a sense of what was going on in the in the building, the, a kind of a physical and emotional sense of what was happening. And in 2003, I walked around the building for 45 minutes and didn't hear a single person laugh. Mm. And by then we were well into the, you know, by 2001, we were well into downsizing. By 2003, it had become almost a weekly activity and it didn't stop. So it kept going. And it was after that that I decided that I needed to do something about that. I was already helping people see the world after AT&T or at, at that point, Lucent Technology and eventually you know, Lucent Technologies and then and then Alcatel Lucent. And I was already working with people on those transitions. So it it became you know almost a almost an imperative for me to pull to go further than that. So I opened my practice that was primarily in the in the beginning uh, business coaching. And then I started working with people on relationship building and recovery from relationships, both personal and professional, uh, primarily because I started working with people who were dissolving partnerships in the business world. And then that moved into more personal things. And then eventually started working with, with um, then the HR stuff just kind of came back into my sphere because of the business coaching. And I work with the smallest of the small businesses the solopreneurs and the and the businesses that are you know 30 or fewer employees half of my clients have been on their own or with small organizations so i work with the people that are trying to learn how to be business owners and becoming you know creating a future that is that they choose so mm -hmm. a lot of and i had already been coaching but then I started realizing I have a I have a master's degree in psychology, and I started working with the neuroscience pieces and pulling that in, uh, in terms of we can reprogram our brains. We can do whatever we want if we understand how our brains are processing information, and mm -hmm. that there you and I have talked about that in terms of relationship building and how powerful conversations, true conversations, can be within relationships. And so, so I got, you know, an alphabet soup of certifications and, <laughs> and that sort of thing. And, you know, I, I started working with that and it's been, it's been quite a ride. So, so now I, um, I work with uh, my most recent foray is working with introverts. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a division for introvert brain coaching as well, you know, specifically around managing energy and using again the brain functions to understand you know how we get the most out of our out of our existence and out of our relationships regardless of what's going on in terms of our own energy levels and how we choose to mm -hmm. engage so it's so that's what i've been doing 
And it's it's awesome. I mean, I've been following you for years. And um, yesterday, I did uh, I, I did that interview online. It took me a little bit. Thank you for helping me figure out the sound problems because mm -hmm. it was the first time I was using Streamyard to try promoting a video other than you know my little open. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting that you know I just couldn't get the sound to go through. I'm sure there's a way to do it, and I'll have to practice that again. But um, the person I interviewed yesterday was the guy from Woomp. There it is, and the Geico commercial. And what I found really interesting about him is he was a one hit wonder back in the, you know, the nineties. And, but he kept reinventing himself as he kept going along, you know, he kept, he went from, you know, being that to, you know, going back to DJing and then all of a sudden he became a voiceover artist. Now he's an actor. Now he's doing, you know, he's doing movies. He's doing, you know, still doing the womb there it is and commercials and, and, you know, going to the Super Bowl and doing those kind of things. So he's, he's constantly like building on what he did. And, and the reason I found that so interesting was because I think that's one of the things that businesses have to learn how to do is be resilient. Mm -hmm. And I think nothing, um, nothing but experience, I think, of, of going through, you know, recessions and, and what you went through at at and of all those people being grumpy in conference rooms and not smiling could get us prepared <laughs> for something like a pandemic where we're all locked down and business just all of a sudden went out the window, or at least the business as we knew it, right? Yeah. So what, what do you think that um, all of that stuff taught you that helped you prepare to help people during the pandemic and do things that, you know, they needed to do to survive? Yeah, so the so there's one fundamental truth around this is everything is based on choices. And so regardless of what's going on, like with DC yesterday, the thing that came through in that interview is that he was constantly, he didn't realize it because this is more natural for him, but he never stopped providing himself with options. It's like mm -hmm. he, I, I, I thought it was funny when he was saying that as soon as he saw something, he had to do it. Mm -hmm. so he was engaged and interested in everything and he never lost that no matter what happened in his life. So, and he credited his parents with that in terms of forcing him and his brother to, to work basically to, to earn their place in the world by, by engaging and being helpful and doing what needed to be done. So they yeah. helped him build that sense of resilience. He didn't need to recognize that because for him, it's a it was a natural thing that he never left himself without options. And he always saw that he had the possibility. He called it hubris, but I call it confidence that he mm -hmm. recognized in himself that Failure is a choice also. He never said that, but that's the message that was coming through. Very but true. So, so everything comes down to choice. Mm -hmm. So with everything that happened in the pandemic, it felt like there were no choices. I heard it over and over again. Well, I don't have a choice. This is what's happening to me. The interesting thing from a neuroscience perspective is as soon as we believe something's happening to us, we give up our power. We, we choose then to let everybody else control what goes on. So we mm -hmm. may not be in control, like in the pandemic. We were not in control of the pandemic, but we were always in control of how we responded to everything that was happening in the pandemic. We always had a choice. And sometimes the choice was to get up and get dressed or stay in your PJs all day, what kind of cereal you're going to have, what you know who you're going to call first in the morning regardless the the one fundamental truism that is also functional from a brain perspective and i'll i'll speak to that in a second but what's functional from a brain perspective and the fundamental truism that everything is a choice and if mm -hmm. we accept that then we retain our own power to make choices about how we're going to interact with the world so, Absolutely. So that's a, yeah. So that's a that's a, a key thing. And what did I say I was just going to speak to in a second? Uh, you're going to speak to choice again, but something <laughs> along that lines. I didn't write it down. But to your point, you know, when we're sitting there, I remember, you know, at, at, there was that point 
where it was really obvious what was going on. And a lot of companies came back and said, okay, you know, it was March last year. It was about a year ago now. Yeah. And they all said, we're going to stop doing what we're doing. We need to stop spending money. And it wasn't because they were afraid. It's because they had to refocus their energy. Uh, one mm -hmm. company I work with had, um, you know, 25 employees. And they went from being a sales organization to an IT organization. They were too busy setting up everybody at home, getting their internet working so that they can continue to communicate their business. And then finally they came back and said, okay, we noticed that the only way that we're gonna be able to survive is to keep, get the word out there. So there were, you know, some companies that just fell off the face of the earth and the other companies actually spent more money and more energy in building relationships and maintaining relationships. Mm -hmm. And that was the one thing that we've had these great conversations about. And I knew at that point, you know, when, when all of a sudden everything at the bottom fell out, I said, okay, you know, don't panic. Here's the thing you do. Just go in and just start talking to people. How are you feeling? What are you doing? What's going on in your world? You know, it, it just be there and be present. And, and sometimes that ended up turning into, you know what, I, I think I need to talk to you or, you know, I need some help. Can you connect me with somebody? You're just there as a person trying to help them. And that's one of the things about HR. I think that's so important is I consider HR the study of people and how they perform and how you take care of them and how you engage them, right? I mean, is that pretty much what it's about? Yeah, that's a, the, the employee experience, if you will. So all of those things that you're mentioning are components of the employee experience. And that's what I talk to businesses about is that when you engage employees, like there are books, there are so many books, like in my office here where I'm sitting, I have 500 books. Half of them are probably HR related, you know, or psychology related kind of books. And probably a quarter of those are related to the concept of employee engagement. So over the years, a lot of people have talked about employee engagement. It was a big thing for the Gallup organization back in the early 2000s. And there were lots of studies and lots of definitions that came out of that. But the reality is the, the only definition that matters on employee engagement or the only measure of employee engagement that matters is how people feel walking through the door every day. Mm -hmm. So the figurative or literal door. It's like, so when I see on Sundays that everybody posts, oh, I have to go to work tomorrow. Oh, this is terrible. That, that tells me that there's a, a lowering of engagement. But then I, I've also looked into that with people I know, and it's, it's become kind of a joke that everybody is supposed to feel bad about mm -hmm. going to work in the, in the morning on Monday. So on Sunday, they post memes and things about it. But, but it really comes down to not what people say or do, but it's really about what people think and feel, mm -hmm. primarily the feel, walking through the door in the morning to start work, whether that's from their bedroom to their office or driving to an office. And then again, how they feel leaving at the end of the day. That's the true measure of engagement. It's, it's an individual thing that happens in everybody's psyche, so every individual. So when we talk about managing, and this is, I've been obviously with the pandemic, the concept of managing remotely has been a kind of a, a challenging experience for a lot of managers. But the reality is we, we don't manage groups and we don't manage companies. We manage individuals. Mm -hmm. So everybody has a role to play and everybody's job is the same. Everybody's, everybody's contributing to the success of something. Mm -hmm. and so, so when we look at that, everybody's talents and everybody's personalities and everything they're contributing is individual to them. And during the pandemic, one thing that I think a lot of people realized is that we can't manage anymore based on the number of hours people put in, because that was impossible to measure a lot during the pandemic, even though a lot of managers held on to it. They were trying to figure out how to do that. But the reality is we measure the contribution people are making, and we recognize right. that contribution, not just physically, not just with tangible things like submitting a report or things like that, 
but also how they talk about things. So that what you mentioned about talking to people, main, managing the relationship and maintaining the growth of a relationship in, in a period of time where we never get to see each other face to face, that should have taught a lot of people a lot of things. And it did for those people who recognized that everything they were doing day to day was a choice that they were making and not simply a reaction to things that were outside of their control. Right. And I saw, I saw the gamut. It, it ran, the continuum was really broad. <laughs> well, and I, I, I think, you know, when you sit down and you look at a company, um, and I, I, I cannot remember who said this, and maybe you remember, but it was, you know, the, the purpose of a company is, you know, a lot of times when you look at bigger companies, it's to serve their stockholders and then serve their, you know, then serve their board and then serve their C-level and then serve their people and serve their customers, you know, and, and so it, it becomes this, you know, dichotomy of how, how you look at the world when I think the companies that are most successful are the ones that serve their employees first, serve their customers second, and then serve the rest of that third. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. There, there's, um, I think I would put it in a more holistic perspective is that we, we need to be looking for balance. But mm -hmm. the bottom line is, if if your employees are happy, then your business is healthy. So there's, and and that assumes that you're also taking care of at the same time, the other parts of the business. So we mm -hmm. can't ever expect. And since I work with a lot of uh, individual, you know, solopreneurs and small businesses, I one of the things that I tell people is that you can't expect people that work for you to think about your business the same way you do because their perspective is different and their needs are different. So if we respect each other's perspective and we respect, so if a business owner respects that individuals are there for their own choices and those choices might not be in lockstep with the business owner's choices, it creates an opportunity for a conversation to understand. And that's the coolest thing about this is everything is founded in conversation. We don't interact with people without conversation. And right. we can choose if we're just going to move information back and forth or if we're really going to engage and be willing to ask questions that we don't have answers to and really willing to allow anything to come up into the conversation. And that's the that was the secret. So, yeah, we, we need to take care of the employees, but beyond that, allow employees to take care of them, themselves, allow employees to identify their needs mm -hmm. and, and not feel like they're, that they're just there to do a job. Right. Uh, well, and I think part of it too is, you know, <laughs> is engaging them in a way that makes them feel like they're making a difference. I mean, that's, you know, one of the things that we talked about offline um, before we got into this was the concept of Vicky guy of having that purpose, you know, and, and that was one of those books I found on Blinkist. And when you start to understand that, you know, what you're good at, what does the world need? Uh, what can you get paid for? And I forget the fourth one off the top of my head, but the bottom line is you, you find your, you know, your center purpose of, of what you do. And I think yeah. that investing in your employees and getting them to feel that that this, you know, the work that they're doing is not only, you know, advantageous to them because they're good at it, they enjoy doing it, it's making a difference in the world and they're getting paid for it. And you mm -hmm. and you create that center for them. When they do that, they go to work with a different attitude. They have a different attitude about the business, you know. And, and that was the thing about DC yesterday is, man, he got up every single day saying, what do I need to do to be successful? Yeah. You know, what do I need to yeah. do to be happy? Yeah. And that was the interesting thing is that, again, that because I see past the words into the experience and and everything about him, you know, he's he was talking about the money motivators in several places during the interview. But mm -hmm. the reality was he's he's motivated by happiness. Right. So so his his motivation was about feeling 
valued and and feeling like he's making a contribution to the world and and to everybody who depends on him. So he's he sees the he sees the balance. But I thought it was interesting. It struck me kind of intuitively that even as he was talking about money motivators and success motivators, the reality was he feels like a happiness motivated person. Mm -hmm. and, you know, in, in terms of the energy that he that he lives inside of. So, yeah, and, and during the interview, I felt like he was trying to, you know, be a motivational speaker almost, and that was the thing yeah, about it. I think you he's know? naturally that because because that's his energy. He's he's he seems to be energized, you know, kind of like an extroverted person. I you know, I've only mm -hmm. and you know, I've only listened to him talk, so I can't be, have an assessment on that. But he seems energized by that. He seemed to have a higher level of energy at the end of that interview than he did at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So at the oh, beginning, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's kind of cool. And he he's just he he was awesome. He was, no, he, he was. was. And, and if you guys want to watch that interview, yeah, <laughs> I've been singing that song ever since. Then. If you want to see the video, I actually put it up on Bacon Podcast. He's episode six six eight, and um, so you guys can go listen to it. You can watch it if you want to. It was just it was a great interview. I put it up live yesterday because I thought it was, you know, it was inspiring. It was something unique. Mm -hmm. So when we, you know, so taking taking that from an HR perspective, um, sure. you know, we're the key thing is getting your employees motivated, protecting them, keeping them. Um, you know, I don't necessarily have employees. I've had them in the past. I've been an employee. You know, I, the one thing I could say, I, I'll never forget this. And it was, um, uh, I cannot remember Dave's name, but he was the guy who was basically my boss's boss. And I went into him and I basically told him at the time, I said, you know, I think I deserve a raise. I mean, I've been doing, you know, amazing work. I've gone from this to this. I mean, I've improved my skills. I've invested in myself. I've gone to college. I've, you know, done all these things. And he basically looked at me and he said to me, he says, Brian, you, you've got to understand your commodity. I can replace you at half the price. He says, you're lucky to be here and have a job because you're an expense. And that's the way I look at it. And I just went, um, I went, whoa, you know, that really kind of that flipped me off, you know, mm -hmm. and that was just a bad. And that's when I decided, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to stick around here if I'm truly an expense and I'm not having any value to this company. And I'm just basically a line item that they're putting on their, you know, spreadsheet every single month. I'll go do this on my own and, and make a difference in the world, right? Yeah, it's exactly it's kind of the similar mindset. And that's what that's what business owners need to look at their employees and recognize. It's not about motivating other people because that's actually not possible. You you can facilitate the opportunity for me for people to feel motivated, but that's something they do intrinsically. And that when you were talking about purpose a little while ago, and purpose is, is important because we need to understand we we look at the world through our own filters. And everything we explore in the world and everything we engage with or or experience in the world is processed through a through a part of our brain that's job is to assess threats. So, mm -hmm. so we, so our brains are constantly assessing threats. So when we recognize, and, and also we're assessing threats based on our own experience. So our life experience, everything that's happened to us, everything that we think we feel we do and we say, all of those uh, things are inside of our own brain. So everything we experience we're not only assessing for threats, but we're filtering based on our own experiences. So we can't naturally understand what's going on in someone else's head. The only way for us to find out what motivates another person or what the, another person's purpose is, is to ask. Because we spend too much time as business owners and as people, as human beings, making assumptions about everything that's going on in the world but because we're doing that through our own filters and we're only seeing the world through our own functions, brain functions, vision, you know, whatever senses we're using for that. So we have to step out of that and make and ask the question, what's really going on for you? What's true for you inside of this experience? 
what has to be true in this environment for you to feel motivated? Where do you gain value? There's actually an exercise called the value meter exercise that was in a big book of, of business games uh, that I probably still have somewhere in a closet. And what it was was to, to create a kind of a value meter that if you imagine that everybody in your organization has a, a value meter hanging, hanging around their neck and it's your job to raise the value, to fill it up, to fill up that meter to 100% every day, what are the things that you can do to, to make that happen? So, so it's, you know, a lot of people jump right to, well, I can tell people what a good job they're doing which is awesome, but it's also important to be able to tell them why they're doing a good job and to ask questions about it. So instead of saying, oh, I think you did a good job yesterday, to be able to say, hey, Brian, I saw what you did yesterday and it really felt good to me that you were making that contribution to our clients. And I'm really interested to, to hear how valuable it was for you and, and how do we make that work for you going forward? or mm -hmm. a similar thing like that. So it's so there it's all it, it comes back to the conversation and to the willingness to avoid making assumptions and to recognize that we're making a choice every time we step out into the world and that if we want to know something about somebody else the only way to find out is to ask and so, you know, that brings up a couple of key points. I think one of the things that we tend to do is we tend to be task goal oriented. You know, it's it's like you set goals, you said all this other stuff and you have to accomplish X amount in a day. And I think what you have to do is you have to set X amount of time aside for relationships every single day. As a matter of fact, if if, you know, if you could give it a number you know, would it be 20%, 25%, 50%, 90%? What would it be? I would say it has to, it has to be a, a kind of ladder kind of thing. Everything we do has to engage. So it shouldn't be something we're adding to our calendar. It should be something that's incorporated into every activity that we have. Right. So relationship building is something that and not just building, maintaining. It's about basically having relations, relationships in your life right. require a consideration of that other person. And it requires 100%. So when we think of conversations, we think, you know, that we're, we've got it, we've got two people in a conversation. That means each of them owns 50% of the conversation, but that's not true. Each of them owns 100% of the conversation. And if we're asking more questions than we're making statements, then we, we have an opportunity to move forward. But mm -hmm. we recognize that it's all about the relationship. It's all about what we need to know, what, or more importantly, what does that person need to know? So when I engage in a conversation, and if I want to say something, I recognize that in, in the world of communication, it's always about the audience, right? So mm -hmm. you, I think you've said that to me before, too. Many so times, yes. It's, it's always about the audience. So it's not so much about what we want that audience to know. It's about what that audience wants to know. It's like, right. So what's important to them? And how do I create a message that lives inside of the relationship, even if that relationship is only as long as that conversation, it lives, and there's a, there's an it and it and it engages the brains. So we're right. not we're, we're not just working from a you know calendar. We're not, we don't have calendars in our brains. We're way more complex than that. And in fact, our brain cells themselves, they, there's actually brain cells in other places in our bodies besides our brains. So, so there's a reason why our bodies work together and that we have literally brain cells in, in, our, heart, in, in our heart muscles and also in our gut that, that process, that's the autonomic nerve system and the whole neurological system. So there's a whole bunch of technical stuff and people can look at my website to get a little uh, mini course on neuroscience, but, um, 
but the but the reality is we have control our brain works and a whole bunch of different multi-layered functions and mm -hmm. we can make choices about how we engage and we can use those choices to reprogram how we address things so if we can if we can see relationship relationships as critical to our outcomes and if we're willing to put in the effort to to basically stop and smell the roses if you will then it's not something we have to add so it's well the thing the thing that i'm trying to say is uh, i'm not talking about building a relationship like inviting your employees out for a beer one on one right, you know it's not right. it's exactly. not that kind of thing but i exactly. think i think what you have to do is and this goes, you know, because obviously I'm in the sales and marketing business. I think the best way to create marketing is to have the salespeople talk to the customers and bring the entire sales team together and say, okay, what's the pulse? What are you hearing? What are the fears? What are the needs? If you were to talk to a lot of the customers I work with right now, everything is supply chain. You know, the, the salespeople are saying, you know, hey, you know, we're here to sell you this and the customers order things. And it's like, OK, we'll deliver that in four to six weeks. And they're saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I need that yesterday, you know. Mm -hmm. And so what you have to do is you have to listen to what the salespeople are hearing and, 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 and help them, number one, overcome the objection, you know, and say, give them some father and say, hey, look, you know, the entire industry you know, because of supply chain issues, it's not because a ship got stuck in the Suez Canal, you know, right. that that's kind of a rumor, you know, it's not that it's yeah. really about, you know, supply chain issues with the pandemic, with stuff coming from China, with mm -hmm. manufacturing being re, you know, reassigned to, you know, some of the companies that made things that we needed, we're doing hand sanitizer and face masks, you know, and it's like, and they're retooling and trying to get back into the mix. So I think from a marketing standpoint, talking to your sales team and, and giving them a chance to give you feedback and then feeding them something. I think it's just about being intentional, you know, making time to be intentional, to ask the questions that you need to ask and to listen. That was the one thing about, you know, the interview again yesterday was, I mean, it was so cool to just listen to him talk, you know, and learn about those things. And I think that's a skill that really people need to have, right? Yeah, well, that's a that's the main part of a conversation. So if we're going to if we're going to engage people in in relationships, so if we're going to have a relationship, and what that really means is that we care about what's going on in that moment. So we care about that person. We're we're in service to that person in a way. So when you think about that's really obvious when you think about sales teams and and what that is. We're in service to them. And so what does that mean in terms of that? It's like, how do we step away from the assumption? So a salesperson might be focused on making the sales. So they're driving someone to the pivot point where they're basically ready to say, so how, are we, we, how will we proceed today? It's like, what information do you have to know to be sure that when you get to that pivot point, the, the word is gonna be, yes, we're ready to move forward. And so the thing about like you use the example of delivery dates it's it it always amazes me that something that is likely super important to a customer only gets discussed after the assumption of a sale is made it's like so that's so when you do what you said like bring the sales team together and recognize everybody's input like what's going on ask the right questions ask the questions that start with with what and how. So the more spacious questions that engage options and engage uh, the possibilities, then you're bringing all that together and you're getting a picture of what's going on with that. You're basically building the brochure of that mm -hmm. customer. And everything is like, I call resumes brochures too. It's like when we think of marketing, we're basically saying what's happening to engage interest in whatever we're trying to sell. So what's going on? What's contributing to engaging a customer's interest? And it could be way before they show up with the salesperson. It could be the, the branding and stuff that we've talked about in the past. So 
there, there's lots of things that go on, but we're basically, when you get that sales pe- those salespeople together, you're basically building a brochure or building an avatar mm-hmm. of that customer. What's true about that customer and how do we know when those things are true and how does that change what we do in terms of the questions we ask and, and how we do that? Does it change the venue that we're going to have a conversation with? Some customers are... You know, you, you have to go to their office. Others want an excuse to leave their office. They're, so there's no one process. Mm-hmm. And when I've worked with salespeople in the past, that's the that's the thing. We, we throw out the process. They It's really the, the person that's got to drive the process is the customer. Right. So unless you're just selling widgets, you know, then it's a little different. But, you know, like, but those of us who have lived in the place where we're the widgets, it's like that, 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 changes, <laughs> well, that, that changes things. Right. And that gets back to kind of the core of what we're talking about is, you know, I used to think that HR was the person that you went to to get hired, the person that you went to to get fired, and the person that you went to to talk about your <laughs> benefits and your time off and, you know, your 401k. And that was it, right? Um, yeah. But I think in the small business, you know, there. It's like in in my world, you can't hire. You know, they can't hire an entire marketing agency inside their company. You know, it just doesn't make sense. When and this is something that happens to me is a customer will come to me after we work a little while and they'll say, "Well, you know, I love what you're doing, but we want to hire somebody to do it now." And I said, "Okay, that's great. Who are you going to hire?" And they go, what do you mean? I said, are you going to hire an SEO guy? Are you going to hire a web guy? Are you going to hire an email marketing person? Are you going to hire a content writer, a web page writer, a programmer, a designer? You know, which one of those people are you going to hire? And then do they know enough of the other people to be able to bring them in and supplement what it is that they can't do? Or are they going to try to do it all themselves and take forever to get it done and not do it as well? Yeah. And so in the HR world, I think it's kind of the same thing. It's like they don't have time. They can't hire an HR person to do all those different things, a benefits person, a, you know, um, bigger companies like AT&T. We got to see you had people that specialize in each little niche. So from a yes. small business standpoint, what do they need to think about, about managing their asset, their human capital inside their business? Where do they need to focus their attention to get the best results? And where do they need help? What did you see over yeah. the last year? Yeah, so so in the last year, a lot of it was really about managing remote workforces, uh, moving past the assumptions that people are making. Like there, there were, we still have managers who assume that if if they don't see their employees every day, then those employees are not actually working. So it's a it's a filter that people have built over time, and so a lot of it when I was helping people move their their uh, measuring sticks into the tangible like Mm -hmm. what does it matter how long people are working now we have that that's there are some legal aspects around that exempt versus non-exempt so i'm not speaking to all of those details but just in general that if it's somebody's job to answer the phone all day the only measure is are they answering the phone all day um is if there's somebody's job is to complete a report, uh, you know, to fill in data every day, then the measure is, is the data filled in. So when we set those kinds of goals, it really comes down to if we're managing through the relationship, then it's all about the question. So when I call one of my employees, and I, I used to do this because I had remote teams back in the, in the Lucent days. And so I, I, call them or I'd have, you know, in the remote meetings and whatever was going on, it was more about the question. So it was more about, you know, what's going on with you? What's what's the most important thing that I need to know about today? Uh, yada, yada, yada. You know, we could go into lists of those questions. So so it really comes down to if if a manager wants to get the most out of their employees, then they should be managing through the relationship rather than the assumptions that we make about each other. So Mm -hmm. what do you, what needs to get done and why, you know, what contribution is it making? If people can, if managers can help employees understand the golden thread 
between their contributions and the success of the company, they've moved themselves forward in a way that goes beyond. And we don't need to know that. Well, actually, we do need to know the the manager does need to know what's what the purpose. Like you said, like you've got an employee whose purpose is to bring a paycheck home. That's cool. Now you know that they're going to be focused on that. If the purpose is to make a difference to stay busy, then you know something else about that person. There's if if a, if the purpose is to gain experience so they can move on to another thing, then that's cool. Then the engagement with that person is going to be a little different than the person who's there just for the paycheck. And there's nothing wrong with being in a job just for the paycheck. That's what mm -hmm. people are offering. Um, uh, somebody, we hire a person to do a job and we promise them a paycheck to do that. It's silly to assume that they should have a bigger purpose <laughs> until they tell us, you know, that's what we hired them for. So well, and, and that, that gets back to, you know, what we initially talked about. And in the marketing world, it's like, People get upset when people defriend them on social media or unsubscribe from their email list and all this other stuff. And the bottom line is, you know, don't be upset if somebody doesn't want to pay attention to all you're talking because at this moment, they're not interested in it. They may have been interested before. They may be interested in the future. So when you know an employee or a person that you're working with motivation, you know, then you, you need to have that conversation. Even if they're a contract employee, you should be having those conversations. Absolutely. Say, where are you at? What's important right. to you? How can I help you? And, you know, and if you're going to move mm -hmm. on, you know, if somebody wants to move to another place, it's not your job to grab them by the coattails and hold them down. It's your job to let them go, yeah. but also then plan to fill the gap, you know, figure out, okay, I, right. this person, this person excelled, they grew, they want to run their own business, they want to do something else, you know, they, you know, they want to open a nonprofit, all that stuff is cool, you know, yeah. learn from it, and then find somebody else to fill that place, you know, that's the key is I think we get too attached, and we get we take it personally, right? That, that should be part of the whole workforce planning strategy. Mm -hmm. that we don't like if, if we've got like I've worked with businesses who have um, who are in uh, industries where the wages are lower. So the assumption is that so the wages are lower. And when we when we get mad that somebody leaves a job with low wages, instead, we should say, awesome, that you found a better job. And then you basically have an organization that's a stepping stone for for other things. Uh, even if we have high wages, it's we look at what what is motivating. And there's the Gallup organization and several other organizations did work on this a couple of decades ago, if not more. That you know what's motivating people, what's encouraging discretionary effort, what's encouraging intent to stay. So that's the whole measure of employee engagement. And we just can't know until we're willing to ask the questions. And there's a I've, I've always said that if you really want to retain people for as long as possible, give them everything they need to be marketable anywhere. It seems a little like it's a counterintuitive process, but the yes. bottom line is if an employee <laughs> has everything they need, where's their motivation to leave? Mm -hmm. if, if someone is getting all the development that they need, that they're giving given opportunities. That's one of the things that I am really grateful about the work that I did back in the whole AT&T, Lucent, Alcatel Lucent days is I spent 28 years with that evolution of companies. And I had, I think I was promoted like seven times. I, I had maybe 12 or 13 different jobs. And that was what kept me there. It's because my motivation was don't get bored. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I was, as soon as I started getting bored with something, then I started looking for something else. And I was also very lucky to be able to create in whatever job I had, I was able to make what I needed that job to be. So I was able to create something more than what was intentional about the job. Right. And, and I, I have to agree with you. A hundred didn't mean much. 
I have to agree with you 110% because I remember what, you know, now that I look back at it, because you're, you're, you know, you're taking me down memory lane. And <laughs> what happened was, is my boss at the time, Mike Dostal, um, he ended up moving over to a different division over in building five. And then they brought in the photographer from graphic arts and made him the manager. And he knew nothing about what we were doing. And I think what really kind of motivated me to stay there was learning from, you know, Roger and Linda and, and Mike. I mean, they kept just investing in me and teaching me things and trusting me. I remember the first time Mike said, uh, Hey, you're going to be a cameraman tomorrow. I said, I've never shot a camera in my life. He says, okay, well, I just want to warn you that the camera you're putting on your shoulder is an Ikigami IL-79 or EL-79 or whatever it is. And he says, how much is your house? And I said, it cost me 40000 He says, this is twice the cost of your house, so don't drop it. Go go do your <laughs> <laughs> And the first shots I'm taking, I got Linda and I'm doing this because it's like, I, you know, I'm balancing the thing. And then after a while, it's like this, you know, I'm super, super steady. It took me, you know, they invested in me. They gave me, you know, feedback. They, you know, there was a growth potential there. And I learned so much from those people. And I went from being, you know, a yeah. grunt moving. My first job was wiring cables, basically labeling cables to move the entire studio from Western Electric in Lyle to the NSC. Oh, yeah. And then from yeah. there, you know, then I, I learned how to shoot. I learned how to edit. I learned how to, you know, repair gear. I mean, my degree was in electronics and I learned how to do all of this stuff. And then the minute I stopped learning is when I stopped being interested in the business. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So that's it essentially yeah. speaks to what you're talking about is that motivation to keep growing yourself is huge. Yeah. yeah. And it didn't even, I didn't even realize it at the time I should have, because prior to going to AT&T, I rarely held a job for more than two years. I was easily bored. So mm -hmm. looking at the opportunities and that's, and that's understanding how people engage in the world. You know, I was a, I was an easily bored introvert. So it was very easy for me to get over a job mm -hmm. for that. It was easy for me to detach from it. So, so that changed when I was able to kind of create the job I wanted and expand the contributions of every job. Because I, when, I, when I did the conference services job very early in my career, one of the things I'm most proud of is that I took that job and I was the only applicant for the job. It was considered a really bad job to have, but I was the only applicant and I recognized that I couldn't fail because you know everybody thought it was just a terrible job. So there was no <laughs> way to fail on mm -hmm. that job. Well, when I left that job like three years later, 35 people applied for it. Mm -hmm. So the, the in three years, I was able to basically change the zeitgeist that this was a terrible job to 35 people wanting that job. Wow. So it, so that, that was one of the proudest moments. Unfortunately, it's that far back, but that was the <laughs> coolest thing we found out. But, uh, but those are the kinds of things is that I had, I was lucky to have managers who recognized that if they, if they paid attention to, my perspective then they that they were going to not only make me happier but they were they had a chance to improve the 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 effectiveness or the efficacy of the job itself right and, and you were there basically to serve all the other people who needed to present yeah. who needed to set up meetings to do all those kind of things so basically you were making you were part of making the entire employee base happy and less stress doing yeah. what they were doing. Because I remember just setting up the, the projectors, these people would just freak out. You know, they were so yeah. <laughs> they were so nervous about presenting that they would beat you down. You know, it's like, well, why isn't this Why I need this, where's my what? You know, they were just so over the top, but it was because they were nervous about presenting. So what, my, what I learned how to do as I started doing it was how to, how to joke with them and calm them down and make them feel like, hey, exactly. I got this. I got this. I got you. You're going to be great. Don't stress. And the next yeah. thing you know, they became some of my best friends, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There was the, the opportunity to talk to people on their level. It's like recognizing what they were going through right. and asking the right questions. 
and that so and that was it. And then one of the other. Out. Well, I'm sorry to step on you, but one of the other things that immediately came to mind with that is um, okay. there was a, there was a VP. Her name was Beth Eddy. And I remember going down and getting coffee oh, yeah. and talking to her all the time. And I, hey, Beth, how are you doing? And one time, Michael, um, my boss, came up to me and says, dude, she's a VP. You need to call her Miss Eddie, you know, or, or oh. you know, something like that. And I, I looked at him and I said, but she told me to call her Beth. And that's what I'm going to do. Because, <laughs> you know, I said, Miss Eddie, she's, no, call me Beth, yeah. you know. And she wanted that kind of relationship. But there was that, you know, kind of like, stress point where my boss was saying, no, no, you got to call her Miss Eddie. You need to respect. And it's like, I'm not disrespecting. She told me to do it, you know, and this is who I am. So you're, you're talking to people on their level. You're making them feel comfortable. It, they want to communicate the way they want to communicate. And that's essentially what, you know, I do in my business is figure out, you know, how people want to be communicated to and then talk to them that way. Right. It's, it's it goes back to everything that yeah. we're talking about. So without, yeah. um, Without stressing you out, we got five minutes left. Can you believe we've been on oh, for yay. 55 minutes? Yeah. You know, we do this every time. Every time I know. we have a conversation, we, we do this. So 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 let me um, speak to one of the things that we're talking about is HR in the world. But the reality is HR is not just about employees. HR is a relationship. Like right. One of the things that one of the biggest parts of my business from the HR perspective right now is just being on the end of a phone. It's like, so I, I run basically an HR inquiry desk where people kind of a pay as you go sort of thing where people, you know, you asked about what do people need when they need HR. Sometimes they just need to be able to ask a question and get an answer that they feel confident in. Mm -hmm. And so that's someone like me who's who's a generalist across 30 plus years in the in the in the industry can do that. It's, and it's not just knowing. I don't have all of that stuff in my head. It's just I'm also a master at finding things on the Internet and also interpreting data that's out there. So sometimes that's all they need is ask, because a lot of times the, the so-called HR person in an organization is also the person that manages the office and maybe does the bookkeeping and things like that. And there's it's it's crazy to think that they know that even businesses that have HR people still sometimes call me uh, to ask those to to be able to ask a question. So so that's a critical thing for HR and business. But then we move to the leadership. So if you have employees, businesses need to know that there's a function of leadership there. So you're not just, you didn't just hire some people. Now you're responsible for engaging them. These people are dependent on you and you're dependent on them to contribute to the success of your business. So what's the job of a, a leader then? This, this is another thing that a whole bunch of people wrote books on. Def, defining leadership, and there's a lot of great definitions of leadership, but it really comes down to the function of leadership. And at the base level, the function of leadership is to make other people more successful. So how are you going to do that? That's really the foundation of the relationship in, with people from a human resources perspective. The reality is we hire people because we need people to contribute to the success of our business. And in return, it's our job to contribute to the success of those people. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? And it, when we recognize that our brains are going to set filters for us that we've got to step out of those filters to be able to ask the question, you know, what needs to be true in this moment? What needs to be true for me to get what I need? What do they need? What, mm -hmm. you know, the whole, every question that starts with what is a pretty good question. And the, the last thing I'll say is that it's important for people to listen to themselves. Listening is the foundation of conversations. It's if we if we don't know how to listen, if we're constantly waiting for our next turn to talk because we know what we're going to say, then we're not really listening. So when we listen to that and we start listening to ourselves, we can start hearing those assumptions and challenging ourselves. And in challenging, we disrupt what's going on in our brain and we have the opportunity to shift those neural pathways. And so challenge challenge every assumption that we make and you're on the path to success period so let me let me summarize a handful of things that we talked about so first and foremost 
we are not only in the relationship business with our customers, we're in the relationship business with our employees. We need to ask them questions and listen to them and understand their life goals. We all listen with filters and bias and we need to overcome those. And I'm listening to a, a handful of audiobooks about um, um, philosophy and, and stoicism is one of them. They say to yourself, when you hear something and it gets you upset, you should ask yourself, why do I feel that way? Or why does this challenge me before you act on it and do something, which I think is huge. So the, the key and thing about age. Yeah. Go ahead. More, more importantly to that is that why, why do I choose to feel that way? Right. That's exactly. A powerful question. Right. And that's the stoicism side of things. That's that's essentially yeah. what they talk about. But the, the key. The key thing to everything here is, number one, realize that you're in a position to make your employees better, to help them grow, to um, that you're not just there to provide a paycheck and benefits. You're there to provide a, a the ability for them to be happy and successful. And by doing that, that will make your business better, make your clients happier. And that's what really the essence of HR is right is about, right? It is. Yeah. That's awesome. All it's right. Not, not just so, about paperwork. Everybody can do the paperwork. Right. So it's 11 yeah. o'clock. Um, and so I yeah. want to go ahead. And if people wanted to get a hold of you, I put your website up. Um, is there anything you want to share as a last thought? You know, if you if you have questions, you know, everybody can talk to me one time for free. <laughs> awesome. Well, and you just talked to him for an hour for free, which is fantastic. So. Go. Yep. Okay. So I want to thank you so much. This has been a blast. I've, I've wanted to have you on. As I can't always. wait to get you on the podcast. And, um, awesome. you know, we'll talk about some of this stuff because I think the mindset piece is so huge. And and I yeah. love the concept and the and the road that we went down about treating your employees to be successful and, and you know, maybe even leaving you someday. So, so with that being said, my friends, um, I hope you enjoyed this and come back next week for thank another you. awesome baking and coffee. Doreen, thank you for your time and uh, your willingness to come on. It was great. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so, for having me, Brian. My pleasure. It's always a joy talking to you. So with that being said, that's today's bacon and coffee. We're going to leave here with our digital caffeine. Y'all have a great week. We'll talk to you next Saturday morning. Bye-bye. Hey.